Good morning, and welcome to this service on June 14th. We are right up there at the middle of the month. Time is moving on. I just wanted to say I'm delighted to be here in a completely different setting, in a completely different way. And I also wanted to say thank you to those who have worked to ensure that the music, that the sound, that video, that slides, that everything is working to bring this service to you. I also wanted to um, make a very special announcement. Very pleased to announce two memorable milestones for Miriam and Dave Barry. First of all, the Berries celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary in May. And on top of that, Miriam turns 84 years young this month. Lots to celebrate. And may good health and happiness follow them as they continue on their journey together. There is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Let us worship God. Let us join together in singing our first hymn, All People That On Earth Do Dwell, number 65. joyously come together to worship, realizing that we need not summon you into our midst, for you are here. We need not call you into the secret places of our hearts, for you are there. We need our eyes of faith to be opened that we may see you, our ears to be unstopped that we may hear you, our minds to be sensitive that we may know you, our hearts to be tender that we may receive you. Grant each one a blessing, O Lord, as each has need, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. And we continue to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is God's gospel promise to forgive our sins, give us eternal life by grace alone, because Christ's one sacrifice finished on the cross. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are going to sing our hymn, Lord, Listen to Your Children Praying, 449. Listen to your children singing. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children singing. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Listen to your children kneeling. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children kneeling. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. This is a time in the service that I always love. And today, it's a little bit different. I have sometimes been in congregations where I have done a children's conversation with the adults. But this is definitely a little bit different. And today, I wanted to talk about something that maybe um, would have been better when I actually had people in place. Uh, you may not be able to see. This is um, a bungee cord or part of a bungee cord. And we all know how good bungee cords are and how strong they are and, and all the things that you can do with bungee cords. But this one um, was actually, it was actually cut. It didn't break. It was cut. And then I started to look at what makes up the bungee cord. And it is made up of a whole lot of little pieces of elasticy stuff that will actually snap. Each piece is not really that strong on its own. And I could stand here and probably snap every single one of them, which would then show me a little bit of concern if I was wanting to use this for something where it needed strength. Because there just isn't in one of these little black pieces. But when you put them all together and you wrap them together, 
I can't. I can't make it snap. And I thought this was really, really intriguing because, and especially maybe today and in our world today, if we try one by one, just by ourselves, just me by myself, there's probably not a lot I can do. I can do my part. But it's not until we get everyone working together. And then if I'm going to take it a little bit further, we get everyone working together and we get wrapped in God's love. And then it's just not possible to mess with that strength. We can do amazing things when we do it together, maybe with a little social distancing, but when we do it together and when we do it knowing that God's love is with us. And so for that, again, I say thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ we pray. Amen. I'm going to, uh, to change the order of the scripture readings just a little bit uh, because I want to read the psalm first. This is Psalm 100, a very impressive psalm, if I do say so. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And then turning in the Old Testament and reading from Exodus chapter 19, verses 2 to the first part of verse 8. Exodus chapter 19, and I am reading all of these readings from the New Revised Standard today. So Exodus 19, starting in verse 2, says, They had journeyed from Rephidim, entering the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then turning to the New Testament and reading in Matthew's account of the gospel, in chapter 9, beginning at verse 35, and reading until verse 8 in chapter 10. So Matthew 9, beginning at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God for this word to us today. So I tell myself this on a regular basis, that I shouldn't be choosing a title for my sermon. Too much ahead of actually figuring out what my sermon is going to be. But I think this comes fairly close. Paying attention. We have here in the Exodus passage a call. A very unique call. And actually, I I don't know that we often talk about it as being a call. But this is a call to the gathered people with Moses, to the people who had been released from slavery, a people who had followed Moses into the wilderness, a people who had been obedient to God when God said, go, go. The call comes to the people as they've gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai. People have been called to go not only in new directions, but also to leave the security, if you can call it that, of what they had known in Egypt. They'd been called to move on and to move out into new experiences, toward new challenges, to a whole new way of being and living. And we have Moses. Again, someone who was called by God. Someone who had to step out in new ways. Who had to take a stand against the Pharaoh, against so many people. Who had to lead. Who had to pass on to the people what they were being asked to do and to be by God. There were many times in the story of Moses and the people and the Exodus where Moses shares with the people what God has given and done for them. And there are many instances in the story of Moses and the people and the Exodus where the people push back. They're not happy where they are. They do not have food. They do not have water. They do not have any sense of what is coming or where they're going. And so they do push back. But also many times, They keep coming back to what God requires of them. So they're camped here in the wilderness, in front of the mountain, and Moses went up to God. And God explains what it is that God requires. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured people. You shall be a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. And then as we read, Moses summoned the elders of the people and sets it out for them. And the people answer, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I've always really liked that image in this passage of the eagle carrying on the wings. I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. That imagery that is... It is God who is acting, that it is God's choice. Their very being was an expression of God's love, God's will. 
They were chosen by God and carried and protected to do God's will. And so I wonder if we would answer in this way, everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. And I wonder how we hear the voice of God. After all, we don't have Moses. But where and how do we hear God's instruction to us? And do we respond? Do we see ourselves being chosen by God, being carried by God toward the purpose that God has for each one of us? And it's not just that they had been chosen that we see in this passage in Exodus. Yes, they have been chosen, but there's also a responsibility to that. And the people gathered with Moses have to make that decision. So it's not just a case of God chose and we obey willy-nilly. Yes, God loves us, chooses us to be God's people from the beginning of time, but we have responsibilities in that. We have to accept those responsibilities. I like the way that the sentence in the passage reads, if, if, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. There is a lot of emphasis on that if. God's not assuming, God's open. God's ready to welcome. God's ready to pick you up on eagle's wings. But we have to accept. We have to take that responsibility. And the people did respond in the affirmative. They said, yes, definitely. But we know because we can read on further. We know that was a promise that they made that it was very hard to keep. There were many occasions on their journey when they faltered, where they had issues with God and with Moses, where they had difficulties with what they were being asked to do and to be, when they wanted a physical presence, a golden calf, This is not a response that was at all easy for them to keep. And as we know, the story is much bigger. This is just one piece of it. Over their long history, the people were obedient. They were also divisive. They were quarrelsome. They flat out disobeyed. They were strong. They were weak. I've always liked Moses. I've always felt very strongly about Moses. Moses is one of those characters who was not always sure of what God wanted, who was not always sure that he was the right choice for God. He struggled. Many times he said to God, Basically, no, you, uh, you, you don't want me. I can't do this. I don't have a voice. I'm not a leader. I'm not strong. You don't want me. So I guess if you look at it in, in one way, <laughs> Moses was just very human. And God does not only call those who are strong. God does not only call those who are prepared. God does not always call those who look right. God does not always call those whom God knows will say yes. And we have in our psalm today words that show exactly how amazing it is to be chosen by God, to be part of God's creation, to know that the Lord is God and that the Lord is good that God is faithful. Can we say the same? So how do we respond? Well, 
it's through Christ, we're shown how to respond to that love, to that faithfulness. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus shares what it is that he is asking of his disciples. They are to do what he has done. He goes to the cities, he preaches in the synagogues, he travels, he gets it done. And he commissions his disciples to do that same thing, to carry out his ministry. In the same way, we've been called to be obedient to Christ's ministry. We've been called to go out, to proclaim the good news, to cure the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out demons, whatever form that means. It may look different, but the commission is ours, just as it was theirs. And in the midst of our world, in the midst of the division in our world, in the midst of the challenges in our world, in the midst of the hatred and the intolerance in our world, Christ sends us out. And we need to discover what being sent out means in our world, in today's society. And then we need to do it. So what does that mean? Well, I think we need to focus on paying attention to what the good news is. I've been reading over the past month and a part Matt Bruff's new book, uh, Matt is the minister at Prairie Presbyterian Church in Winnipeg, and he's written, this is his third book that he's written. It's not quite out yet. He's doing a study with a group of people, and we're working once a week on the chapters. But it's entitled, Let God Send. Crossing Boundaries and Serving in Christ's Name. And one of his chapters is entitled, Make What? Well, Make Disciples. Matt says it's not enough to simply go for God without any real idea of what you are going to do and why you are doing it. Now, I'm an introvert. I was born an introvert. I have learned how to be around people. But a part of what being an introvert means for me is that I'm one of those people who has a difficult time in doing something if I don't feel prepared. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be different. I don't want to be noticed. So, for example, in public school, I played on the volleyball team. But it took me a while to get to that point because I wanted to be sure that I could do this. I didn't want to stand out, be different. Now, I know that wasn't in my head consciously at the time, but certainly looking back, I know that's what it was all about. And during my years working in the London area and in the Hamilton area in the congregations I worked in, I was a part of um, two clergy curling clubs. I learned how to curl, and I loved it. But again, it took me a while to get comfortable with it because I wanted to know how to do it right. It was not something that I wanted to get out there on the ice and blow it or mess it up because I wasn't prepared. I wanted to be prepared. In the same way, over my years working in the variety of congregations over the last 40 plus years, I found many people who were not sure they wanted to be involved in something until they could do it right. For example, the number of people who've told me over the years that they wouldn't come to the Bible study group just quite yet because they weren't sure that they knew enough. Now, for me, in my head, the whole point of having a Bible study group was to learn together. I often found also in working with children and teaching and leading and recruiting, those that I thought would be excellent teachers and leaders, again, sometimes said to me that they weren't sure that they knew enough yet. 
They didn't want to be working with the children and youth and not have all the answers. Well, I've spent my whole life working in the church and working with children and youth, and I still don't have all the answers. So back to that, make what? Make disciples. And who's supposed to be doing that? Well, as I was reading Matt's book, my mind went back to my first congregations in Sarnia, Ontario. There was a congregation in Sarnia who had a sign out front which had a title, the clergy, and underneath that it named the ordained minister. And then it had another title, the ministers, and under that it named the congregation. And I've always found that very interesting and very true because I think it truly is the way it should be. It's not one person or two persons or three people's job to make disciples. We all have a role to play in the life of our congregation and in the work of the church, small c and capital C. And it's true that we each have different roles, roles that maybe have something to do with what our day-to-day -day activities or what our experiences are, but we are called to make disciples. Unfortunately, I also know for some that making disciples really relates more to putting butts in the pews. If we have more people, then we'll get more money in, then our church looks stronger, then we're more successful. Again, I've worked with congregations over the years, and unfortunately, this is not an unusual thought to have. The idea that we invite others to join with us, or we draw others in, or we have programs that will bring others in, is really because we want to be seen as a strong congregation with more numbers. When I've done children's programming in the summer and then start up again in the fall with some of our regular programming, I would often get asked by members about where the families were that we had in our summer programming, where the children were. Why aren't they with us in church school? Why haven't we seen them in church school? Why did they not come out on Sundays? Because for many, having a summer program for children was not to offer the love and the message and the welcome so much as it was to give us more people. It was more about what do we get out of it and not so much about what can we offer. Programs that are seen as outreach programs are again sometimes about getting people in instead of how can we be of service out. And I know the idea of having ways to meet people where they are and then some who do come into the church. But that idea of, of offering ways to meet people, whether it's for social time, whether it's for a meal, whatever it's for, whether it's for um, service groups, whether it's for support groups, Sometimes we get people who are then a part of our congregation because they come in through that side door or that back door, as it were. But that shouldn't be the reason why we hold that program or why we have that service or why we offer that. To be a space where those who need and want sharing time, fellowship time, a meal, a safe space, seeing to the needs and responding to them. A past minister that I worked with, or a minister in the past that I worked with, always referred to this kind of thing as love with skin on. I've been doing some reading lately on mindset and that gratitude for what we have should call us to pass it on and to share it. 
what we have in the knowledge of God, what we have in the good news from Christ, what we have in the love, should be something that we want to share, just because it is. The idea that we offer up that goodness, that message, that gospel, not because of what it will reward me with, but because it's just too good not to share. Paying attention to what we are being called to do and to be for God. Paying attention to how we can share that. How we can help others to respond to that call in whatever form it may take. Amen. Thanks be to God. We are going to sing Thou Whose Almighty Word, hymn number 291. of and for the people. And for all of you at home, you offer your prayers, your specific prayers. Let us pray together. We praise and thank you, O God, that you have fed us with your word. And we offer to you our prayers for all peoples, grateful for your gifts, mindful of the communion of your saints. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor, the sick and the dying, those who are struggling with COVID-19 issues. We pray for all who are lonely, the victims of war and injustice and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. O oh Lord of Providence, you hold the destiny of the nations in your hand, and we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and the minds of our leaders that they, together with all of our nation, may first seek your righteousness, your goodness, your love, so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. 
O oh God, you are the creator, and we pray for all nations and all peoples. Take away the mistrust and the lack of understanding that divides your creatures, your creation. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children. And we pray especially at this time for all those who are in difficulty. We pray for those who suffer because of the color of their skin. May we truly learn what it means to love. O Savior God, look upon your church and its struggle here upon the earth. Have mercy on us in our weakness. Bring to an end all the divisions. Scatter our fears. Increase our courage. Strengthen our faith. Inspire us to be witnesses to all peoples, even to the ends of the earth. You are the author of grace. You are the God of love. Send your Holy Spirit's blessing to all your children here present, at home, far away, in all parts of your created world. And keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior. Amen. We are going to conclude. Our concluding hymn is number 755, Go Ye, Go Ye Into the World. steadfastness and encouragement grant us to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ go now in love to serve and make disciples <laughs>